Hi everyone, this is Phil at New Skeptics. We are broadcasting live on many, many platforms. Uh, actually, two just right now, but we'll, we'll broadcast on live on, on all of them. Our guest tonight, special guest, is uh, number one in philosophy and number one in sci-fi visionary on Amazon with The Transhumanist Wager, a great book. I have just finished all except 25 pages, which I decided to save for myself when I could relax and enjoy them. Um, it's fantastic pace to that book. Um, and so, welcome Zoltan. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Phil. I very much appreciate it. It's great. I, when I read your bio, I was pretty floored that, that you had uh, seen one of my little things I put out and said, hey, I would like to be on there. Oh, yeah. No, I was, uh, I'm stoked and I uh, look forward to uh, this conversation. It's, uh, it's exciting, and I'm really happy that you're almost finished uh, with my novel. Yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, I could have finished it, but I really want to enjoy that last bit. I just, you know, it's a cliffhanger to me. Yeah, and no, and the last 25 pages have uh, some twists. I won't give them away, but uh, there are uh, there are definitely twists coming. That's great. I have really enjoyed the pace of that book. I haven't read a novel in probably a couple of years. Hmm. No, it's tr I feel like a lot of um, you know people that are uh, 25 and older end up not reading that much uh, in the in terms of fiction because there's so many great nonfiction books out there and. Uh, especially uh, you know in, in our day and age it seems like that's become the bigger industry uh, however uh, you know when I started out even thinking about writing about my ideas of transhumanism and atheism and stuff like that I just felt like a novel uh, sort of goes further but I have been running in that, into that a lot where a lot of people are like wow I really haven't read a novel in a, in a long time uh, I read all the time I read nonfiction books people tell me but um, I guess somehow fiction has sort of been uh, left uh, at the wayside a bit as people read a lot of the great nonfiction works that are out there these days. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, moving right along. <laughs> Zoltan, your, your, your bio is extraordinary. Um, I'd like you to take all the time you like and tell us about your real life sailing and fantastic adventures as a Nat Geo reporter, please. Sure, sure. Well, um, I won't take too long, but I'll, uh, you know, I, uh, when I was about 20 years old, uh, about 21, I left on a sailboat, a small sailboat, only about 26 feet, and uh, with about 500 books, and um, I wanted to uh, go around the world. In fact, I, I, I wanted an apartment of books. That was my real goal, and, and uh, unfortunately, when you're traveling, unless, you know, as you're backpacking or any other form of uh, travel, it's really difficult to carry all the books that you wanted, and sailing was the very best method I found for carrying my books, which is why I chose to do my uh, my very long sail trip, with, which lasted around seven years. Um, so I left on a boat at a very early age and had all these great books to read, and uh, I uh, was um, already done with school, and so I essentially uh, just... Um, sailed, adventured. I was uh, in the South Pacific for four years, uh, mostly alone. Uh, you know, I was anchored to islands, so I wasn't, wasn't really on the ocean that, I mean, I wasn't actually doing sea time or sailing. I was just simply anchored, uh, having great time meeting a lot of the locals and just uh, participating in culture and stuff like that, and also just reading. And um, eventually I got introduced to journalism, and I was able to secure a really uh, cool job with the National Geographic Channel. Uh, at a very early age in my 20s. And uh, from that point on, I just started doing a lot of uh, kind of short uh, uh, news clips, uh, webcasts, and also uh, articles for the National Geographic website. And uh, that was uh, incredible because I got to do, you know, over a period of like four or five years, 30 or 40 different stories. You go to one country, then to the next, and then to the next. And so I had a great time really exploring the world, writing about it or filming it. And... Um, uh, just, you know, having a great life. Uh, somewhere along the road, though, I, I've always been attracted to transhumanism, which is what my book is about, um, The Transhumanist Wager. Um, and as a young person, you often end up covering conflict zones or war zones uh, as a journalist because uh, generally the older people don't want to do it and the newbies get to go to the war zones. That's just the way it works. So I was in a couple conflict areas and it 
heightened my uh, drive to dedicate myself to the transhumanism. Um, and transhumanism, just to explain real quickly for your listeners, is the idea of moving beyond the human body using science and technology. Uh, the Latin of it is really just beyond human. But it can be anything that really takes you into uh, something that we might not consider human, but something different. Uh, it doesn't need to necessarily be an entire new species. It could just be augmenting an arm or uh, even using a cell phone could be considered transhuman. It depends on how you want to look at it. But uh, I wanted to dedicate myself to it because transhuman uh, ideas hold the very best hope for uh, achieving kind of uh, an indefinite lifespan. That's the main thing, at least for me, behind the, the goals that I have is I'm trying to find a way to live indefinitely. And so I wrote the book trying to promote science, trying to promote... Uh, transhumanism so that society would find a way to achieve its um, an indefinite lifespan so that we don't have to die. One of the things you realize when you're covering a lot of war zones is that there's a lot of death, there's a lot of misery, uh, there's a lot of madness. It's, it's best if we can find a method out of that. And so, you know, just coming to a close with my biography, I then spent, uh, after my sail trip, um, I then spent about four years writing the novel, wanting to use uh, this novel as a way to dedicate myself, kind of uh, talk about transhumanism to people, write a book about uh, that would get people inspired to join the movement and to also dedicate themselves to science and technology. That was my main goal with the book, was to actually try to get uh, the everyday person to say, wow, science and technology is not just science and technology. It's a method for overcoming um, the limits of the human body, especially the idea that we're going to die. And it's also a, a very um, atheist, or you know, at least as I like to think of it, based field. I'm a pretty strong atheist, and I wanted to promote ideas that don't use religion to try to help uh, the species and civilization out, but instead just use reason, use uh, common sense, and use our own, uh, you know, our own ambition, our own drive to make the, the species better. That's fantastic. I want a terabyte of, of memory I could like attach like right here to my brain. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm just going to continue if you don't mind. Um, I was looking for parallels in classical literature to characters in your book. I suspected that Zoe Bach was a Dante-esque Beatrice type character um, representing beauty but also representing Sophia or wisdom among in, like in classical Greek philosophy. Um, is there some of that in there? You know, so 100%. You know, the books that I had on my boat, which I think really f formed the foundation of much of my philosophical, th philosophical thought, were really a lot of classics. And Greek philosophy, Roman philosophy, um, they certainly uh, are kind of at the core of a lot of the ideas that I had. And so certainly when you talk about Sophia, especially wisdom, uh, Zoe is very much based off that idea. And... Um, and, you know, as, as I think uh, Jethro Knight is based off the hero's journey, uh, kind of a Campbell uh, character where, um, you know, a lot, of great, a lot of literature creates a scenario where one person will go on this epic journey through life to accomplish some type of epic goal. And, um, and that's clearly what, you know, the protagonist Jethro Knight's uh, thing is, is that he has this singular goal, which is to overcome his, um, his own death by, uh, through science and technology. And, um, and so, yes, all the characters are quite symbolic, and uh, names are chosen for various reasons that are also symbolic. And, uh, you know, um, uh, every, uh, mo most of the lines in the book have been gone over at least 100, some 200, 300, 400 times by myself. So uh, th there's not a sentence in there that, or a word in there that's not uh, designed for some type of effect. That's good. I mean, I even caught this this idea that Jethro Knights, I mean, he's kind of like, I mean, it, it's reminiscent of Jethro Tull to an old guy like me, you know, but, and I don't think you were including that, is that, I was probably adding that, but he, but Jethro Tull's stage garb was in fact medieval um, design. Well, and, and you know, I, I've, uh, uh, I've always, Aqualung has been one of my favorite albums uh, forever. <laughs> so uh, I, I do know, and definitely the name Jethro, uh, to a certain extent, um, may have come from Jethro Tull because I have been, that's, I think, where I originally heard the name Jethro. That said, I actually now have a few friends that are also named Jethro and just seem to be a good uh, name that came out of, of you know, the, the various names that I was looking for. 
uh, and uh, in fact, even very names changed. Uh, you know, since the book took me so long, I start off with different names, and then ended up with the names that uh, we have uh, we have now in the in the novel. Okay. Okay. Well, I was a huge Tull fan, and in fact, I imitate Jethro Tull. And when I finally come to do that on the show, I will send you a clip of that. Oh, good, good. <laughs> uh, okay, but it, but anyway, and he was a Renaissance man, and I, I, you know, it, this is a, an idea in your book that like Jethro is is without question a Renaissance man. Um, so let me continue. Um, the parallels, especially to America's conservative Christian mentality, are striking. Um, New Skeptics works with local educators concerned with uh, the phenomenon's impact on science literacy and social progress. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I think that's great. I mean, the more entities, the more organizations, the more webcasts, the more media that we have, with people trying to do stuff um, that ends up helping uh, kind of a, a secularist mindset, uh, a science-based mindset, a, uh, a mindset that advocates reason, perhaps that's the most important one for me, um, that nothing could be better for the world because we're coming out of, you know, a couple millennium of, you know, very dark times where very deeply religious ideas have held society back have held innovation back and I feel like now more than ever as we are approaching what could be a very dangerous age, the, the transhumanist era where you know machine intelligence is going to be coming online in 25 years and we might be replacing our bodies and uploading to machines, more than ever do we need organizations and entities out there that are going to be advocating for reason, advocating for uh, you know using our intelligence to, to make the transition into uh, this kind of new society I think that's going to emerge in 25, 30, 40 years. And so I'm excited with what you're doing. I think it's, uh, I think it's brilliant and I think it's very necessary and very needed and congratulating right. you on the work you're doing. Fantastic. I want to tell you about one thing that's coming in just about exactly two weeks and that's going to be the Ask New Skeptics gadget. And this is going to dispel supernatural beliefs. It's like a Wikipedia. It's a Wikimedia gadget. It will be on our site, and people can go to Ask New Skeptics, and they will find out if they've got junk science or they're dealing with some other bogus claim. Oh, cool. Great. Okay, and meanwhile, I've got professors at the local university backing my public endeavors here, um, uh, I'm, I'm arranging a, uh, a debate right now, so we've got that going on. I've got some of the best Bible scholars that are there, period. And uh, Robert M. Price, uh, Richard Carrier is watching our org, and if he likes what he sees, he's going to put his name on it. We've got Raphael Lataster, number one in religious philosophy on Amazon now, with there, there was no Jesus, there is no God. And uh, we've got David Fitzgerald, who is a fantastic, entertaining personality and activist, and a very deeply uh, decent human, in my opinion. Okay, well, uh, Reverend Bellinas, um, uh, he's a religious zealot grasping the reins of American political power, and he's the arch villain in your book. Um, I've seen a privilege in our culture for religious faith with its attendance it's attendant ignorance and superstition, and I suspect you do as well. In fact, you just said as much, but sorry, these, these are sequential questions. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, you know, so Reverend Bellinas is, I think, you know, one of the caricatures of the, real, the book, where I really did go out of my way to create a stereotype um, that we do have in society. And uh, he is a very black and white character, uh, on one side of the fence and you know a lot of my the, the characters in my book are very black and white I paint them that way because I feel uh, sometimes when trying to make emphasis it's it's easiest to just have everything um, you know one shade one color and then the, another one so you can compare it and he is this classic you know um, biblical Bible thumping person who's uh, a leader and who's been taking over people's minds uh, all across the country and the world trying to trump uh, any kind of scientific innovation. He basically just wants to go back to farming the land and maintaining his power. 
And frankly, he's doing nothing that the popes haven't done for centuries. I mean, he's just replicating the entire thing. That was when I was talking about millenniums of baggage um, that has been put onto the species. He's just propagating it. He's just pushing that forward again and again. And, uh, and I created a character because I do believe, even though maybe we don't have anyone as, as, uh, with as much charisma in today's uh, American religious scene, um, there are certainly so many evangelists that are, in my opinion, really hurting society, hurting innovation, and especially hurting the length of our lifespans. If we would just, as a nation, spend more time and money towards um, the science of life extension, towards the science of just everyday living, I think we'd all be living much better lives. But, um, for example, if we just took all the wealth of the Catholic Church, we would probably, within a decade, have all the clues to achieving uh, indefinite uh, lifespans for the species. Um, but that wealth is being spent in ways that is not is nonsensical. It's not spent in the ways that actually benefit the evolutionary advancement of the species. And so I created a character where, uh, you know, that comes out as as symbolically or as, as clearly as possible. And that's certainly Reverend Bellinas. He's the uh, the main villain in in, uh, in my novel. <laughs> okay, thank you. I'm going to let uh, Jamie come in with a question now that I noticed he's probably been wanting to ask it for 10 minutes. Sorry, Jamie. Go go right ahead. I'll mute myself. Oh, thanks, Phil. Um, if it's not too much to ask, I'm going to throw a I'm going to throw a softball at you, Zoltan, and then maybe segue that into something a little more uh, critical. My, my hope is that maybe we can get some of the skeptics of this idea on board uh, if I if I hit you a little harder uh, with some things so so my first question is going to be I, you know I've noticed that you have and I don't want to spoil it for the audience but you have three laws of transhumanism that are they're clearly inspired by the three laws of robotics originally written about by Isaac Asimov and so I was hoping maybe you could talk just a bit about uh, what influence Asimov's work may have had on you, and and maybe any other, uh, you know, uh, Phil mentioned this, but and what other uh, philosophical influences you've had? Sure, um, I would uh, um, be happy to. Uh, so I, I've always liked uh, Asimov. He's he's always been. Um, Jamie, you might have to hit your mute. I think. Or because I'm hearing all that. There we go. Um, look, I, I, he's been a hero of mine forever, and so uh, you know the three laws are, as you point out, taken um, quite uh, you know directly from that as a, as a kind of a, a tip of the hat. That said, you know my uh, he, he's much more of a humanitarian man than I am, and or at least he, his books are that way. He comes across as much more um, concerned with humanity, and of course my book is challenging in the sense that it. Uh, sort of throws the human being underneath the bus and goes for something else. Um, so while I've been very influenced by his work, and I think he's a brilliant writer, and I have studied him a lot, um, I, uh, I'm not necessarily really that on board with a lot of, I think, his deeper philosophical ideas. Uh, that said, you know, he, he's, in, he's in 50 years back. You know, I'm trying to create something original and take... Uh, at least my idea of where the species is going to something, something new. So I'm, uh, you know, it's definitely my three laws are definitely a tip of the hat to him, though, in hopes that people would make the correlation that, you know, um, there's other ways of looking at those three laws because the three laws for robotics have stood the test of time. I mean, they're they're incredibly <laughs> well done. Okay, thanks. I um, I enjoy Asimov's work, and of course. Some of the work that I do, and some of the uh, some of the things that I'm going through in my education, is delves deeply into science and into uh, philosophy. So I want to I want to segue from that that first question kind of into this one. If I were um, a skeptic to this idea, hearing what you've just said, it, it seems to me that the first challenge, assuming I'm already on board with science. The first challenge or, or roadblock in my mind is going to be, well, I, I hear you caring about the human race. I, I hear you wanting something better for us. But what protections or what what barriers 
might we be able to erect to stop what could be this dangerous hubris that some people are going to to think that you're you're advocating for? Well, um, I uh, you're right. The book advocates for some things that even I personally am not ready to do. There's clearly that, and I've said that you know since the very start. While I'm uh, very much uh, appreciative and inspired by Jethro Knights, he does things and thinks things that I, you know, as a family man, with wife and children, have a very hard time to actually, I think, do. That doesn't mean that I think they're wrong, and it doesn't necessarily mean that I um, wouldn't try to do them. It just means that I find it, uh, his, his philosophy is very challenging in the sense that they may be a morality that is uh, even too early for our time right now. It might be make more sense 10, 15 years when we have machine intelligences. However, I think it's important when we're talking about how people should interpret the book or how people should interpret the philosophy TEF, um, what I think they can do is take the best parts of it and leave the other parts underneath you know, uh, that they don't want and try to make the most sense of it. I felt like as an artist, and you know, I'm trying to be both a philosopher as well as an artist. Um, as an artist, I, one of the things is you try to paint extremes. You paint them so that everyone knows where the boundaries are. And in, in the case of the transhumanist movement, it had not had those boundaries painted yet. Um, when you study most movements, they often have the extremists, and then they often have the people that are you know, the most lenient. And somewhere in between, the movement usually tra traverses. And my idea was to try to establish that extreme militant, radical side, the real revolutionary side of the movement, and say, well, look, this is one path. I'm not advocating it for saying, hey, this is the best path we can go down right now. In fact, I am very would be, would be very much against going down a path that uh, either leaves out anyone in society or that uh, endangers the human race right now or that uh, crosses a lot of the social boundaries that we actually have right now. I know Jethro does that, but I actually think that at this point in time, with the world so peaceful and everything kind of uh, at least going in a direction that I like, it's not the time to do it. My, uh, my ideas are kind of set upon the idea that what if there was a religious conflict? What if all of a sudden there were people in the streets trying to stop transhumanism? What would I do then? then I would actually have to stand up, you know, and go to the streets myself. And I'm hoping that will never happen because, as I said, uh, you know, I'm a normal human being, family man, and I live in the suburbs. You know, I mean, I, I, I fit a lot of the niches, <laughs> stereotypes as well. So I want to just see progress happen smoothly and hopefully that we can um, not have any of those dangerous scenarios that I paint in the book. At the same time, I do think it's important to know that everyone must really choose how far they would go, they want to go, in order to make a transhumanist wager. How far would they take their, their moral systems? Um, you know, and and that's, that is also the point of the book, to try to lead people to let them question that. Um, I know a lot of people have said, oh, he, you know, he's advocating this or that or humanicide. And the truth is I, I was never advocating that. I've just been trying to point that out and say, this might be something that could come in the future. It's also something if machine intelligence, artificial intelligence comes online, as a lot of experts think in 20, 25 years, it also might think like that. I've actually said this a few times that I wouldn't be surprised my book really catches on with machine intelligence at some time in the future. Um, because it, it takes a moral system that um, virtually everybody cannot accept. If you accept it, then you have really stepped beyond the bounds of what it means to be a civil human being. Um, that said, uh, you know, uh, I've been in enough war zones to know that uh, a crisis can change you and a crisis can make you do things that you wouldn't normally do. And that's kind of why the, the essence of the morality of the book is that your moral system is defined by the amount of time you have left to live. Uh, I feel like I got 30, 50 years, so I'm not in any rush right now. But, you know, if I knew I had to die in 24 hours, I think I would think very differently about how I want to go around life extension. In fact, I'd probably be driving down the freeway at 200 miles per hour to get to Arizona to get cryogenically frozen. And my, you know, irregardless of other people on the highway. So those are the, the kind of moral dilemmas that I try to bring out a little. And I, I hope I've, I've kind of gone all over, but I hope I've answered your question a bit, Jamie, because it's a, an excellent question. I, that, I think that's a wonderful answer. Um, 
I, I can appreciate how you've clearly delved into some of these really sticky uh, ethical situations, and I really appreciate the explanation you gave about um, drawing the boundaries, as it were, around these issues. And, and that, almost magically, these are the, your answers are falling in line with some of the questions that I have lined up here. So the, the next kind of question I have, now that I've heard you uh, describe how you've used this story to outline the boundaries of this. Uh, your idea of a transhumanist thought is, when I speak to people about the importance of science and technology and scientific literacy, um, whether I'm discussing specifically transhumanism or not, one thing I try to do is to impress upon them the importance of being scientifically literate now. Uh, not just in a far-flung future, but today, and just to give one specific reason why that's so important today, not in a hundred years, uh, January 1 of 2013, the, uh, the Greenwall Foundation, I don't know if you're familiar with it here in the United States, released their, oh, 100, 114 some odd page report on uh, the ethics, the policies, and the risk of, of having enhanced warfighters as part of our uh, military system. Now, it, one of the things that this report does is talk about the ethics of possible technologies, but, but a, a large chunk of it deals with technologies that we already have and are testing, if not coming really, really close to deploying today. So with, with that laid as a foundation, I was hoping maybe you could say a few words on, now that you've talked about the extremes, Maybe you could say a few words about the importance of of understanding that we need to make these decisions pretty pretty soon. No, one hundred percent. I think what you just said is one of the most important things that uh, can be said is that people don't realize how far advanced we are with some of this technology. Everyone thinks, oh, you know, AI or robots, or, you know, this kind of thing, are far into the future. Um, it's here. It's already existing in many cases. Um, as some people have already, you know, as I talked to uh, some AI scientists the other day, you know, with enough funds, three, four, five years, this could be done. Um, and then you're talking about an intelligence that's superior to our own. That is entirely brand new territory. And even I have to say, Okay, we need to take a step back. We need to actually decide as a civilization and as a species, where are we going? We want to go forward, but we also don't want to uh, have something terrible happen. We didn't build, you know, through all, through evolution just to have it ended up, you know, all of us dying or something stupid or something cataclysmic. Um, so I think the most important thing we can do is talk about it and tell people, hey, this isn't science fiction anymore. This is here. I think the more discussions we have on it, um, the closer people get to saying, okay, and eventually it'll hit government, it'll hit Congress, and then we will, this whole thing will just become wide open. And I think everyone, I, I, I do believe that people will like it. I do believe that people will want these things. Um, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but when it comes down to cataclysmic events, I realize that it's absolutely a, a necessity to have these things carefully monitored. They can't just be left in a bunch of, uh, you know, some a tiny elite group that's just going to let it go. This is too significant. This is like containing some uh, a virus, you know, and letting it out in the general public. It's the same thing when you're having robots that sophisticated, or when you're having artificial intelligence, or when you have the ability for like nuclear weaponry. It needs to be very regulated, very controlled, and very thought out up front so that nothing uh, stupid happens. And um, you know, I spend virtually all day. It's, I know my book is promoting this a whole aggressive side of transhumanism. But I think the other side of that is that by even making all these subjects uh, talked about in the public, it then gets a lot of people just saying, hey, it sounds exciting, but let's talk about the realities. I think that's what everyone's going to say in the end of the day is, hey, great book, but the reality is, yes, let's move forward, but carefully, and let's, let's start getting involved in this and make sure that this doesn't do something terrible. Because a lot of us have enough time left to live. We're not in a giant, I mean, a lot of people are in a huge rush to achieve indefinite life extension and whatnot, but I think um, huge portions of the population would want to see a peaceful and simple and uh, reasonable transition into this new age that we're entering. And um, that's going to take a lot of uh, 
collaboration, a lot of foresight, a lot of reason, and just um, some fear, some fear. Uh, nothing that Jethro has, but uh, I do have it. I'll tell you that for sure. Yeah, I think that um, there's some natural fear that accompanies new things generally, but certainly with new technologies. And, and, and something that strikes me about uh, many people's reactions to the ideas of transhumanism is the idea that we are, we're not just talking about a new age of technology, we're talking about making what it means to be human so plastic, possibly, that we move beyond a conception that we might currently recognize as human. You know, this, this sort of idea of morphological freedom and really just having to alter what we conceive of as being legitimately human. So, uh, saying all that, <clears throat> I wondered if, you know, since you do have children, maybe you could say a word or two about what you hope or expect to see in the lifetime of your children in terms of specific technologies and maybe societal acceptance or resistance to these technologies. Sure, well, <clears throat> in that sense, I'm completely uh, as... I think far pushing as can be. I, whatever it is we can do, uploading, uh, completely getting rid of all flash, um, I'm, I'm completely for that. I think what is important to me is to maintain some of the very basic characteristics of the way consciousness works. Uh, you know, the ability to, to use memory, the ability to rationalize, the ability to create, um, uh, the ability to recognize and appreciate interaction with other entities, uh, love even. I'm not sure if love necessarily will be the same way. I'm interested in exploring all those things. I don't actually have all the answers for it. I think as we cross those bridges, we'll be able to get better grips on it. But I'm completely for it. And if my uh, daughter will one day upload herself and, you know, not be a, any flash anymore, that's perfectly okay for me. In fact, if it's safer for her, if it means she has a better chance of survival and a better chance of becoming more of who she is, um, then I completely advocate that. I definitely currently advocate cutting off my arm and putting on a robotic arm if it's better. I would do it tomorrow, or you know, assuming I had the money for the surgery, I would do it. Um, so I'm completely about upgrading ourselves. I'm not worried about the, plas the plastic kind of uh, uh, idea. I know a lot of people are like, what, what does it mean to be human? I I'm not really that concerned with that. I'm more concerned with what does it mean to be as... Uh, as complex, as grand, as far-reaching as possible. I'm interested in taking uh, the entity that we are and making it as as powerful and as, as uh, large, mm, large is not the right word, but just as all-encompassing as possible, uh, whatever, the, whatever the costs are to that, so long as it doesn't kind of, uh, you know, again, cross the boundaries where we start uh, losing society or are we losing the advantages that we work because I mean after all we've now worked you know centuries millenniums up to a point when we're we all many of us at least in the modern world have uh, the kind of lives that are that seem incredible to me we jump on a jet plane and go places and so I don't want to ruin all that but I do want to take it to the next level and I definitely advocate that for myself and my children okay yeah that that makes um, a lot of sense in the context of the story that you tell and kind of the answers that you've you've given here and, and since you mentioned the you know expansion of human capacity and you mentioned the possibility for instance of getting rid of all flesh of mind uploading um, I know that for, for the viewers that aren't aware that the transhumanist community if you can call it that is, is a wide and varied lot you know, some people who call themselves transhumanist um, see that certain technologies maybe are a better bet to get us to the next level than others. Some transhumanists really kind of seem to place their money on the singularity and just go with let's just expand technological capability as fast as we can and to just hold on for dear life. Um, so one, if I could offer another hypothetical criticism, one thing that I can imagine some people in the scientific community objecting to is the plausibility of some of these proposed technologies. So for instance, mind uploading, that there are individuals in the neuroscientific community 
that are skeptical of the possibility that something like mind uploading is possible. Um, I, I'm of the mind that even if mind uploading is impossible, uh, if we discover that tomorrow, that something like a digital copy of yourself doesn't really give you immortality, um, whatever that may mean, but that we could still just replace flesh to the point where you as a physical entity are still immortal. I wondered what you might say if you had a room full of neuroscientists and cognitive scientists. Is there anything you might say to inspire them to try harder or to think slightly differently about this topic? Well, uh, I, I do want to say that they may be right. There may be a function in the universe, very unlikely, that won't allow us to upload our brains um, into a computer per se. In general, though, whenever we say we can't do that, what we're talking about is we can't do that for 20 or 30 years, and we just need to wait, work on it, and we'll get better, and eventually it'll happen. I think once, especially we bring on some machine intelligences to look into some of our problems, then I think that's when a huge amount of innovation will actually take place. And um, so I'm very skeptical about saying it's impossible to do that. That said, it's very possible that the universe has some surprises for us, and they're just simply based on foundational reasons in the universe. We can't do that. Maybe consciousness is something like that, where there was just a mechanism built in from the very start, and it's going to be impossible to do that. Um, so I would tell them that... Uh, we should get to a point where we know if that was the case, 100% that's the case. And then we should continue to work on it. In fact, even in my novel, this is why, uh, while Jethro believes that uh, digital immortality is probably the key, you know, he incorporates every type of research in his, uh, in his transhumanist nation because, uh, first off, it's very exciting to see, you know, things like, uh, you know, mixing flesh with, uh, you know, bionic parts and whatnot. But also, it's important because there might be some dead ends, and um, if we have put all our eggs in one basket, uh, it may lead us nowhere just to come back 30 years. So I think we all these fields need to develop as quickly as they can, um, and I think there's a lot of us that have certain preferences. I mean, digital just seems so simple and easy, but that said, maybe there is a way that it wouldn't work and that uh, we need to do these other things. But um, so I would uh, try to agree with them and still say, that said, you know, there's been so many cases of science when it, people have said, it's impossible. We'll never know that. And then, uh, you know, 30 years later, they're like, wow, we did it. And then 35 years later, grad students are doing it on their uh, laptops. You know what I mean? So it's really oftentimes science is just a matter of the progression, the exponential growth of that type of research and getting better and better and better, especially with physics where they may say quantum, you know, uh, forces are now the bottom of the universe. But, you know, then they said subatomic. And, you know, I mean, it could keep going. We just don't really know where it's going to go yet. They say there's 14 dimensions. Mm. You know, 10 years ago it wasn't exactly like that. And I can assure you in 10 years it probably will be a little bit different again. Well, I'm not 100% sure of that. I'm not a scientist. But I do look at these statistics and science, uh, like medicine, where they say this is impossible, it changes. It changes as people grow smarter, as research gets better, as more people dedicate themselves to it. And so I'm a, a big optimist when it comes to breaking through boundaries that people uh, say are impossible. And I'm hoping that um, the universe truly is this open slate where we can virtually create anything we want. It doesn't matter if it's time travel. doesn't matter if it's bringing back people uh, you know, from the dead thousands and thousands of years ago. I'm a firm believer that it's just a matter of unlocking the right key and progressing far enough. Can you guys hear me? I can. Yeah. Good, good, because I, I removed myself from the webcast yet again, and uh, I've been gone for about eight minutes <laughs> listening to you guys, but this is fantastic, okay, because I found my way back. Did you want to take over from here, Phil, or did you need me to go ahead and throw another question in? Um, we can do it either way, Jamie. Well, I've got, uh, if you don't mind, I've got a, um, I've got a follow-up to what uh, Zoltan was saying. So, uh, if that's cool, I'll just keep going. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Phil. So, 
Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you that um, I think it was Arthur C. Clarke who said, you know, anytime a scientist says something is impossible, you can probably bet he's wrong. I think the quote goes something like that. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this notion that technological progress, uh, whether it is or is not a completely open book, we, we kind of have to assume that it is and just make the most uh, incredible advances we can uh, in the best way that 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 we can. So, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about here about uh, your views on you know technological advancement on on your philosophy and on a couple of other things. So, I, I'd really like if we could to get you to say a few words on on the actual philosophical underpinning of your story and, and you've called this um, teleological egocentric functionalism and you, you've you've kind of given us some hints here in terms of you know you think individuals yourself your children ought to be able to uh, adopt and accept enhancements in order to make ourselves as powerful as possible to, to live indefinitely and this sort of thing so can you maybe just give us a real rough sketch of the, the maybe the ethics behind the the teleological egocentric functionalism or the TEF I think you call it for short. Sure, yeah, um, it's TEF and it's teleological egocentric functionalism. You know, essentially, the core of the philosophy is the idea that built into at least ourselves. Now, I'm not 100% sure I would say it's built into the universe, but certainly it's built. I feel it's built into me. Um, is this drive to increase my power, increase my sense of safety of myself, increase my sense of nothing can harm me. For me, that seems the most predominant um, ambition that I have, that I can continue going on with life for the simple reason that I love life. And therefore, I want to stop anything bad that's going to happen, kind of going through the three laws of transhumanism. And essentially... If we have this makeup, and I'm not going to you know, speculate necessarily and say it's only a genetic makeup, perhaps it's a universal makeup, something deeper in, uh, in quantum technology or whatnot, but whatever it is, I feel that we are driven, we are all driven to this exact same thing, to become the very best, the, the most protected, the safest, the strongest, you know, an omnipotent, as I would say, in the novel. And... Um, that is the core of the philosophy, is that it is a philosophy that's designed to take you to that place. Now, that's not always um, a pretty place. It's not always a, you know, a lot of the ideas might even seem like they're at odds against everyone else. Um, and, and perhaps they are to some extent, or they will be later in, in, the, you know, in history. But currently, you know, the idea, the preliminary idea behind it is just to ensure ourselves a certain amount of security and uh, use that security to become the most that we can be. And that is the underlying, you know, fundamental philosophy of why I wrote the book, why, uh, what I'm trying to do with transhumanism is to tell everyone that in order to reach this sense of safety, you know, the very first thing we need to do is take away our biggest crux, you know, our biggest problem, which is we're going to die. That completely eliminates, you know, that, that's the biggest issue that we have on hand. So the philosophy was designed to, put forth the philosophical premise of trying to become the greatest, the strongest, the best that we can be, and then starting to eliminate one by one the things that threaten us, and, you know, number one being death. And that's why I uh, thought about TEF, and, uh, you know, the word, the name TEF came 15, 20 years ago when I was at school. I, you know, I've been working on this philosophy for well over a decade now, thinking about the ideas. Um, and uh, it, it, a lot of it just comes from, some of the very close calls that I've had on my travels, I've almost died a couple times, uh, and I realize that no matter what anyone says, uh, when you are about to die or when you are very close to dying or you're being shot out or something like that, nothing else matters except that protection, that kind of sense that I can overcome that. And um, that's how the philosophy uh, is lined up. It's, it's de designed to uh, protect us and keep us all alive and progressing forward, becoming stronger, better, smarter, more advanced. 
Great stuff, Zoltan. Okay, um, would, would you mind uh, muting just for a second, Jamie, and I'll uh, throw another question here at our guest. And I, thanks I, so much, Jamie, for those questions. Those were excellent. Appreciate that. You're um, welcome. Oh. I, I appreciate you answering, taking the time to answer them. It's a, been a wonderful discussion so far. Absolutely. Agreed. Fantastic stuff. Um, I tried to learn speed reading, as Jethro Knights does in the Transhumanist Wager, um, but it's very hard for me. Uh, do you have any advice? I, I have a feeling you probably really did do this. Yes, yes. In fact, I've read a, a number of books on it. You know, the entire key to, to speed reading is when your perception, when you read a book, you read in blocks, you know, two, three words, in two, three words, two, three words, and that's the way your perception, your you, you understand things. It's not, you don't go word by word. And the goal of speed reading is to try to go from, when you see three words, expand that to four words or even five words and grasp the comprehension in one bit. It just takes practice. Um, that said, when people say they can make you read three times faster, I was never, never able to achieve that. But I have definitely been able to achieve and keep up with about 25 to 30 percent faster than I, I was to begin with by jumping from three to, let's say, five words. And uh, in fact, I had practiced this earlier after I read your questions this morning and uh, <laughs> made sure that it was still the same. <laughs> um, and it very much depends. It's very hard to do speed reading with something like philosophy. Um, it's much easier to do speed reading with novels or when you're reading an email or something like that. Indeed. Um, I seem to find that as I kind of relaxed a bit and tried not to look so much at the words, but at a little larger space, I seem to get a little better um, result, but would miss a word here or there. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does take practice. And uh, in the book, I make it seem like it's so easy, but uh, uh, it, it, takes, uh, it, it, it takes, it's a real skill. Okay, um, um, the uh, pace of the book, as I mentioned, was excellent. I mean, it's just there's really not a dead spot in that book. There's there simply isn't. There's some some descriptive verbiage in a place or two that goes on for a few paragraphs, and the next thing you know, the book is taking off again on the new on a new adventures. So um, I'm taking notes on that. Um, and how would you say you achieve uh, achieve that? Because I have many writers as friends, and I, I would love to you know help them if I can. Well, you know, I, I I think one of the things that's funny about this book is that I really took a long time to um, edit it. I spent approximately two years editing times you know six, seven, eight hours a day. Uh, I've, luckily, I had a luxury of four years, essentially not. Uh, well, I, I've been working and doing various business things. Uh, I actually had huge portions of the day, every single day, to work on the book. And so, you know, over time, you, you just pull out the boring parts because they're boring to, to oneself. And so I think, um, luckily, I've been able to uh, uh, somehow get it where the philosophy didn't bog down too much. Though, I, I, you know, people have complained that there are parts that are uh, too slow or, you know, a lot of... At the very end of the book, as you might notice, there's a very long 7,000-word philosophical essay, and that's uh, almost virtually no storyline, so uh, people get bogged down in that. But, you know, by then you're, you know, you're 90% through the book, so I think it's fair to say that uh, you've, you've, you know, mostly read the, the novel. So there's the one point that does bog down. But, you know, the key is just to try to tell a good story, but to stay true to whatever it is you're trying to do. And in my case, I just wanted to bring out a bunch of new ideas that I believe most people that are reading the book hadn't actually thought about. Um, you know, most people at this point reading the book beyond the transhumanist community are completely new to a lot of the ideas that I have uh, uh, brought up. So I'm hoping that uh, they find them exciting too. Are you planning or writing part two yet? Because this really looks like a series to me. Yeah, ultimately I would love it to be a trilogy. And I have the second book very much worked out in my head. Um, unfortunately, I am not uh, writing it at the moment. It takes a, a, a certain kind of space. And uh, I'm about to have a second uh, baby. Uh, I already have a young daughter. And um, I'm also, like, I'm really stuck promoting this book all day long, dealing with uh, um, a lot of different reviews that are coming out. A lot, and I'm, I have all these new blogs. And so I'm finding that it, it, it's almost impossible to even begin the first page. So what I've been working on is a lot of twists 
notes and a lot of ideas and writing out a lot of outlines. But there's definitely a second book coming. And there's a third book where I have kind of a real sense of where the final story would be. Does Jethro actually become uh, what we might call a, a perfect entity, all-powerful God, I mean, if you want to say it like that. And uh, so that, that's, uh, but of course, that's uh, something for the third book. Um, in the second book, I have a lot of uh, plans. In fact, I'm going to bring up a lot of the issues Jamie brought up, which is what if this goes wrong? What would happen if, uh, you know, machines actually uh, ended up rising up? But I, I'm not going to do it in the same sense that we've all read in sci-fi before. I have some um, original ideas on how to turn it around and how to do some twists and hopefully uh, bring out even new ways of looking at artificial intelligence. I think the second book's going to be very much about the morality of artificial intelligence. Um, what would it program itself to be? Maybe it doesn't want to just be form follows function. Maybe it has its own sense of uh, creativity, of moral systems. So uh, there'll be some very interesting things. But I'm, I'm working on it, but not actually writing it at the moment. I see. Okay, well, I'm, I'm considering cutting a question or two here, and I'd like Jamie to prepare to come back in if he would like to. Um, and I see him nodding his assent. Um, but I, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Jethro, he seems like a fiscal conservative. Now, are you a libertarian yourself? I, I would say there are elements of my uh, philosophy that are very libertarian. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical to push, my side entire, push myself entirely onto that side of the camp. There are sides of me that realize that if, as a civilization, we don't move forward as a whole, we might actually pull the whole ship down. So there might be some other uh, sides that um, libertarians might get very upset at me about. Um, but in general, I'd say I like less government. I like less people telling me what to do. I like when freedom has a chance to prosper. Uh, I know Jethro comes across as a fascist kind of uh, dictator for a while, but he realizes that's not the best interest of human beings. Uh, I certainly don't think that's in the best interest of creativity. And I think creativity is perhaps one of the most important things uh, our species needs in order to make it to the transhumanist era, is this idea that we can do these things. We can be wrong. We can be, uh, we can, um, be deadly wrong. We can do really stupid things. In fact, I, I, I often believe that we have to do really stupid things in order to emerge at a place where we, are, we have grown up enough to know the right things to do. So I think a lot of um, libertarians would not like some of those other ideas. But as a, in general, I would say I'm pretty, pretty solidly in that camp. Okay, well, I'm going to. Uh, Phil's been kind enough to turn the floor back over to me. I hope that doesn't have you grinding your teeth. Uh, too no, much. not at all, not at all. <laughs> but uh, I, I want to say for the, for the sake of the audience that, um, and, and I don't do this to try to steal away the uniqueness of you and the work that you're doing, but as I mentioned before, there are other elements in, if you can call it that, the, transhum the transhumanist community. There are other individuals, and, and I bring this up so the, if there's audience members listening, that are completely new to this, I don't want anyone walking away from this thinking that there's just one guy out there somewhere with a couple of neat ideas and it's just that simple a thing. That There are thinkers like Aubrey de Grey, uh, Simon Young who wrote um, Designer Evolution, who's a transhumanist manifesto a number of years ago, and, and even tied to <clears throat> what you might consider a more traditional academic uh, environment is Nick Bostrom um, over at uh, Oxford, and I don't know if you're familiar with Bostrom's work, but he's done some some fantastic things. In 2003, he he has some work called the astronomical waste, uh, the opportunity cost of delayed technological development, um, and, and he's he's got a, a a great thing called the fable of the dragon tyrant, which argues for life extension and how important that is. Do you know any of these guys, or if you're familiar with their work? And whether you are or whether you aren't, do you have any plans or have any hopes for being able to uh, to meet with these guys and maybe maybe have some cross pollination of ideas? So, luckily, at this point, I have communicated with most of um, Nick Bostrom is the one who I have not actually had any personal touch with, but I'm definitely friends with 
um, a huge portion of the community. I'm going to be seeing Aubrey here in about 10 days in the conference, and we've had lunch and stuff like that together. So um, I uh, uh, luckily um, know many of them and have also studied uh, many of them. Nick's work, for example, was uh, critical in some of the uh, development uh, of some of the, the book, as, as well as Aubrey, I mean, who, who hasn't uh, read his books and knows what he's doing. Um, and yes, it's, it's important for your viewers to realize that I am uh, uh, what most transhumanists would call an extremist. Uh, I'm on a, a, certain a certain side of the, the fence, and uh, they, uh, they look at me and they think, okay, well, someone has finally established that uh, outer edge, which you know, most people don't want to go to. And th those that do go are often very young or, or, or are also kind of like aggressive themselves. Um, that said, I think uh, luckily through a lot of the interviews, like you guys are kindly giving me, I've been able to bring myself back and not base my entire personality or philosophy entirely on my book, but more on um, also personality. So that, uh, like I said early, uh, what's important for me is that by writing something that is uh, almost extremist, we can help establish where many of us stand and many of us want to go, that maybe it's okay to be a little bit further uh, aggressive in our moral stance, but at the same time it's certainly not, I don't expect the transhumanist movement to follow down the path of uh, my novel at all. It was not really designed to take them there. It was more designed to uh, get everyone excited about an, an interesting story and to cause enough, uh, and to ruffle enough feathers to get the movement to uh, be more uh, the outside public to take notice and say, "Wow, this is a this is a crazy book. This is a a very shocking book." Um, I think most people come across it though and realize afterwards that uh, I do not represent the majority of the uh, the um, people in the movement. In fact, most of them are, uh, I'll say, uh, at least a lot of the leaders are elderly. They're very deeply based in the academic community. Most of them have PhDs. And uh, they're fantastic, very smart. Uh, they're very grounded. And they are, um, I, I don't want to say slow moving, but they are cautious and they are hu very humanitarian people, the kind of people you want to have dinner with and uh, give Christmas presents to because they're nice, nice people. And uh, I've been lucky that I've really sort of been, at this point, I wasn't always so welcome, but uh, it's, it's now I'm definitely moving uh, amongst a lot more of the circles and uh, able to do what I'm doing. But um, I really do respect a huge amount of the leaders in the transhumanist community uh, for a lot of the contributions that they've made. And um, especially scientifically, they have been working on these things for 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, in some cases, when I was still a child. Great. I'm, yeah, I'm right glad. Here. Just a second. All right, that's all right. You can go ahead, Jamie. I just want to let our our uh, re, our listeners know that we have uh, a project going. We're trying to bring Zoltan to Skepticon here in Springfield, where I live, and uh, we're also trying to bring Raphael Lataster, uh, who is our first guest uh, for our first show, to debate William Lane Craig right here, who is the subject of his PhD thesis. So he is really going after the jugular of the new religious debaters. Okay, now he studies Craig, I mean, very, very seriously. He knows Craig and he talks to Craig a, a little bit. So this actually could happen. I, I don't know that they really want to spring for a flight from Australia, but it, it this actually could happen. But we really, it would be great to meet Zoltan down at uh, the Skepticon, and I, I think you're a shoe-in for that gig. Oh, well, th thank you. I would love to go if that uh, if that ends up working out, because I uh, I have plenty of uh, <laughs> plenty of things to say. I think, and uh, and I, I'm my my I have a huge amount of speeches this year, and I'm looking forward to them. Uh, I think it's great to meet people in person. It makes a huge difference. Then a lot of us just standing behind our computers, which is wonderful. But God, it's just nice to go out and get a drink with people sometimes too. Oh, great! Um, and I'll throw my two cents in and say that uh, if at some point uh, I we here at, uh, can convince you to come down and do something with us, I'd love to see you know if at any point in time in the future uh, I can convince you to come down and speak to a crowd. I'd I'd love for you to be able to get in front of as many people. As possible, I agree with you that meeting people face to face is really, uh, really kind of pivotal in making a kind of a connection. There's a reason why in this modern age we still have 
politicians and we still have academics and we still have people doing book tours even though you know it's the age of the internet um, it, I, I kind of want to go off grid if I could I, I think we're probably nearing the end of the, the journey at some point and so I want to go off grid and, and, and be a little more informal and so uh, maybe I can just throw a few ideas out and then not not really any pre-planned destination just see kind of how you how you would approach this uh, these kinds of ideas so you know in transhumanism one thing that that's often talked about is the expansion of the human ability to just have experiences right what experiences might we have what life might be like if we had senses or means of experience that just aren't open to us and what would life be like if you could see in infrared what would life be like if you could communicate with other people directly via radio waves or something like this, right? It, the kinds of experiences that we might have, we maybe can't even think of right now. So, so somewhat of Carl Sagan, when he talked a lot about his book, which was a tip of the hat to William James, called The Varieties of Scientific Experience. And, and one of the pillars of my view uh, that I try to get across to people about science is that you can have a scientific worldview and give up a religious worldview without also giving up these deep, moving, important, subjective, emotional experiences that you have. You can feel a sense of awe when you delve deeply into science. You can feel a sense of, of you know, incredible, almost transcendence when you contemplate mathematics or astronomy or biology. So uh, just as a transhumanist, as a writer and a thinker, you know, I just wondered what maybe you, maybe some thoughts that you had about that. Well, <clears throat> I certainly embrace all those things. I, I want to take the human brain and push it as far as it can go. And then I want to connect it to a machine that can push it uh, a thousand times that. So I, you know, if there's different types of sensory perceptions, different types of visions, I want them all, and I tend to believe that the more complex, the more uh, definition that we can get in all our senses and in new additional senses, the more uh, moving, the more powerful, the more maybe spiritual the entire experience of being alive will be. I think uh, many times that's what really makes life so, uh, at least when you have a moment that's so special, is because so many of your senses are just heightened. So I can't imagine a scenario where if we don't have all these sen more senses heightened, it wouldn't be that kind of profound of experience. I think it's going to be incredibly profound. So I would like to try to engage in all that stuff. I specifically like the idea, uh, just from a kind of a guy who likes thinking and a guy who likes solving problems, of being able to tap into some type of other or more superior intelligence, uh, you know, myself, I think, but just using different types of uh, perhaps like... The idea is with uploading, if you could tap into uh, a machine that actually has uh, the connections that are, let's say, a thousand times your brain, would you be a thousand times smarter? Well, I would love to find that out because I would love to then solve questions that I never have been able to um, or just um, solve, come, arrive at answers that I never had thought of because they're just so much more complex. Our, our brains, uh, in the sense that we can only see you know, a couple of miles in front of us, um, is the same idea that what if you can see a thousand miles in front of you because your new eyes allow that. Well, I think the same thing is going to be with the way we compute things or the way we think about things. Our thoughts will go so much further, be so much grander. And I look forward to that because I just, uh, that kind of, uh, you know, perception, that kind of consciousness to me seems uh, wonderful and brilliant. I, I just, uh, it, it's, it, for me, that's perhaps the most uh, hoped for thing that I want, just to plug myself in and say, wow. I'm so smart, <laughs> much smarter than I was. Now I can think of anything, and I'll probably write a, a far, far better book. So those are some of the things that I look forward to, and I, I'm definitely optimistic about the entire process of, of that. That's interesting. I, I, I know that there's some research uh, going on, and, and the, the name of the institution escapes me, of constructing what might be called like an external neocortex. The idea is to put raw data into kind of a portable hard drive that you can uh, plug into your mind or whatever and then you can access raw information that would take you normally 20 or 30 years to acquire so like the Encyclopedia Britannica you know something like this 
and and just uh, I see Phil needs to go ahead and kind of uh, take over in a couple of minutes, but uh, just again to throw kind of an idea and go off the uh, map territory a little bit. You know what? One of the things that's interesting to me, like you say, is the idea of you know I love solving problems and just thinking of things, and uh, we seem humans seem to spend so much of our time day in and day out wishing for man. I wish I could just have some leisure time. I wish I could do this, and I wish I could do that. And, and for me, one of the one of the shining doorways of human augmentation might be a world where almost like we've advanced technologically to the point where we can have the old Greek academies again, where you can just spend all day thinking fantastic thoughts and abstractions and sharing them with other people. Um, do you? Yeah, you know, just any thoughts that you might have on that. I'd like to hear uh, maybe what ideas you have regarding uh, not on the other side of becoming drastically post-human, but with some enhancements. What kind of changes in societal culture do you think might happen? Well, first, I would love to go back to that kind of Greek society where you could just philosophize all day and actually not be pressured. I I will uh, hang up with you guys here soon, and I will probably end up doing another 50 emails tonight. I am uh, so pressed with time that I just don't find, you know, life has become very busy, and I would like to take a st step back and be able to write, for example, a second book without the pressure. And um, so I very much look, hopefully, technology will somehow bring us to a point when we don't need to worry so much about food, about uh uh, perhaps social movement, society, we can actually just be artists or worry about ideas and be scientists and, and, and kind of have a simpler uh, existence. It's pretty complex right now, at least in my um, world. But I, uh, I'm hoping that everyone will think and say sort of what you just said, which is, yeah, I want more time to do the things I want to do. And that's what technology should do for us. So I'm hoping that we will make... Um, you know, as technology increases, maybe uh, one day there'll be, uh, you know, work hour weeks will be lessened. Uh, you know, uh, maybe we'll have an extra day. It won't be uh, five days and two days. You know, these are the kind of things that I hope technology will bring. And when you're talking about certain things like how can we have more time, one of the big things that I'm hopeful, one of the huge things that I uh, am hopeful would sink a huge amount of money into is a, is a machine that can sleep for me, some kind of like bzz, and I'm done in one hour or a half hour because I, I, I like sleeping, but I, it, sleeping a third of my life at this point has become ex unacceptable. So those are the kind of things that I'm hoping technology might solve for us where we're like, wow, I feel really refreshed. I just plug something in my head and I'm done and now I'm ready to begin my day. And um, so those are some of the uh, advantages that I see with technology happening. And um, if that's the case, then uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give us all a lot more time to have uh, fun things happen as opposed to um, just kind of stuck in, a, in a, a little hamster wheel half the time, how I look at it sometimes. Hey, great, Running. great, Sultan. It's been fantastic. And I'm, I'm going to wrap this up with a comment and a question. And, uh, well, two comments, because I want to thank uh, uh, Jamie and for his excellent research and uh, uh, communication skills. Really, uh, I, I was able to drop a couple of questions of mine. But, um, I also want to say this this four day work week sounds like a French idea. <laughs> okay, anyway, no. But here's the thing. Now what I've done is I'm cr I'm a crowdsourcer. I I'm crowdsourcing. I have no money, right? I mean it all went to uh, the website and stuff, okay? But I crowdsource with people and I open doors using people's names. So I ask for no commitment whatsoever but I want to ask you personally if you would be a new skeptics expert and join our double doctors our college professors our uh, again number one authors like yourself in in this where we're trying to consolidate a uh, the questions that matter the people whose ideas can really uh, influence this and we're trying to offer it to the to the global skeptic community. Yeah, absolutely. Sign me up. Um, I I don't always have that much time, but I'm happy to lend my name for anything that is uh, 
asking skeptical questions. That is uh, perhaps my favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> if you ignore my emails, I just accept that. <laughs> Curious. Like, that's okay. No, but I'll probably, I may only contact you once a year, quite honestly. Oh, but no, 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 of course. Please, okay. please do. No, definitely. I, you know, I try to do everything I can at this point to uh, help out. If someone's going to ask a question why, it really doesn't even matter what group it is, even if it's some religious group these days. I, if they're going to ask why, I'm on board, you know, because I just think that's the key here is that the more people that ask questions, the more people that search, we're all going to find the things we want if we can just uh, live long enough and, and you know civilly search for these uh, for all the answers together. I mean that's a that's a great society to me. So yes, definitely. Jamie Zoltan, it's been fantastic. Remember, life's tough. It's tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> thank you so thank much, Phil, and thank you, Jamie, for the great questions. Thank you very much.